the subject that we are seeking and searching and talking about is what happens after a person dies? What happens to the person? But before we resume that today, I want to talk for a minute about something that's interesting, to me anyhow. And it's in all the papers and the television and all over the place, and it's called El Nino. And uh, there, there are predictions by some scientists that El Nino this winter is going to wreak havoc all over the place and cause tremendous destruction. There are predictions by other scientists that say, no big deal, it's not going to do anything. But I think it's, it's worthwhile looking at and considering a little differently. Now, the scientists who say it's no big deal and it's not going to do anything are predicating that on the basis of the fact that say every 12 years or so, you have an El Nino. And these are pockets of waters that, in the Pacific that become very warm and cause um, a kind of an upheaval in nature. Uh, but, and I mean, they've always gone on, but you've never been this deep into Aquarius. And I think that can cause a change. Um, El Nino means the child, the little boy. And the, Yes. Yeah. And they call it the Christ child as well. Well, yeah, they do because it goes basically from um, I, I don't know well, up to about the Christmas time and any anyhow. We're, I, I'm not exactly sure how they arrive at that. But the thing that I find interesting as to why we might want to keep an eye on El Nino for a little different power than maybe we've experienced in the past, and 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 it's true. This is not the first El Nino. We've had always had. Them. Uh, but uh, this is what strikes me as being interesting. If you look at the little boy or the child, in mythology, we would think of Ganymede, who is the child and the water bearer, as El Nino is the water bearer. And in the mythology of Ganymede, Ganymede was taken from the earth up into uh, heaven by Zeus to be the cupbearer to the gods. And he did such an excellent job that Zeus made him into a constellation, and Ganymede became Aquarius. So now this child, this little boy, Christ, whatever you want to call it, uh, Ganymede is Aquarius, is El Nino, and therefore, uh, you know, it, I think that to just say El Nino, because we've had him before, but you've never had it before this far into Aquarius as you are, and so it's it certainly would be worthwhile keeping an eye on that and its connection with Aquarius. And I just thought you know, that's something you might want to uh, think about. So you might want to keep an eye on that. Okay, so it's a natural phenomenon, but when you couple it with the effects of the uh, angles and the electromagnetism of Aquarius, it could be um, interesting. Okay, so <coughs> let's uh, do a, a brief synopsis on uh, where we've arrived at. Because what we were kind of searching for is what happens after death. You know, what happens to the person? What happens after the body dies? And we found that, first of all, the first thing that we found that we've proved through the scriptures is that heaven and hell are states of mind. They are not real places. And we found that by using the Bible. Jesus said the kingdom of God is within you. Uh, the Bible says, hell, uh, heaven, uh, the way of, uh, of life is above to the wise, so he may depart from the hell beneath. And we use those scriptures to understand that heaven and hell are states of mind. We also found that the only way we can find this heavenly state of mind is by seeking perfection. And that we find perfection through meditation, by separating from the thoughts uh, of the mind. So... Those are two things that, that we found in our studies. We also looked at the movement of the sun through the signs of the zodiac, and we were discussing that when the light, which is the part of the body we've previously referred to as soul or personality, leaves, it would go to the water, then to the air, and then to the fire or photon and return. And we looked at uh, how the sun in our zodiac uh, moves out of the tomb of the winter solstice to Aquarius 
and then up into the air, uh, Aries where it sits at the right side, and then to Leo at the fire before it returns. We also looked at Jesus, and we found that when Jesus resurrected from the tomb, he went down to the water, asked if they had any fish, which is Pisces, then uh, uh, ascended up into the air, and then was touched by the fire to return a second time. So we looked at these things. We looked at the uh, apparent movement of the sun through the illusion of the Earth's trajectory uh, through water, air, and fire. We looked at Jesus' resurrection through water, air, and fire. And we put as a possibility that when the light, which is the personality, exits uh, from the body at the time of death, it then goes to the water, into the air, and then is struck by photon, the light of the fire, to return. <coughs> Uh, we considered uh, consciousness, and if you remember what we did, we, closed, we did a little exercise here, and we closed our eyes, and when we closed our eyes, we tried to conjure up a voice, and we said, well, you know, the best thing to do is close your eyes and listen to your mother's voice, and you can actually hear your mother's voice, you can hear the exact pitch and tone of your mother's voice, yet you're not using your ears. And then we say, okay, now listen to Elvis Presley singing Hound Dog, you know, you ain't nothing. And we could hear that. And we could hear that Elvis Presley's voice and tone was different than our mother's voice or tone, yet we were listening to both of them without using the ears. We did the same thing in saying, well, visualize with your eyes closed the house that you lived in when you were a child. And we did that, and, and we could see the house. We could even see the colors, yet you were not using your eyes. And, and we even spoke without using our mouth. So we were able to use all the faculties of communication, of seeing, of hearing, of discerning colors, discerning tone, without using the eyes or the ears or the mouth. And then we looked at the relevancy of light and consciousness. Um, we then also uh, discussed, Judy was here and, and, and some of the other people, we discussed amnesia, how a person who would receive or, or, or incur total amnesia uh, on this earth through like some kind of an accident could begin a new life totally and have new friends and new family members without any knowledge of the previous life that that person had, uh, had before. Uh, and, and we looked at that and put this together with our experiences here on the earth without any knowledge of maybe where we have come from or what we experienced before. <coughs> so that we also uh, saw that when we exit the body as light, we actually experience those who have gone on before us, but not in the same realm uh, as we've known them here. Not as grandpa or Aunt Mary or mom or dad or anything like that. People have passed on. We don't recognize them in that role because that's the role they had here in the body. But we recognize them in the strange names that they might have. Uh, let me give them numbers here uh, just for the sake of being able to converse. We say, well, if I'm number 16, I'll recognize so-and-so as number 32, not as mother or father or aunt or uncle or something like that. And then another interesting thing, we realize that when we're in the body here, we're at the same time in light there. Because as light, you can't, you can't confine light to one space and say, well, light is only here. Light is everywhere. So that became very interesting to us in trying to understand how could someone who had died be there as light and have reincarnated here into the physical realm. But we found out that that's very reasonable and very possible to consider that. And all of these things were just considerations. Uh, re remember when uh, Rich Doppler was here and he came up and, and he sat and he became uh, the, the light inside of the fetus when the fetus is in the mother's womb and everything was calm and then we had Al Vero as the voice of God speaking very slowly and very quietly and assuring Rich that everything was okay but then we had each person come up from the, from the audience with a script in their hand and one person became genetics and started telling him what he was going to look like and the other person then became the family and started screaming out all kinds of things and rules and regulations of the family. Another person became the church and talked about all of these religious rules and regulations and another person became the school and another person became the government and another person uh, became ed education, all these kinds. And then they all started screaming together and we realized that we couldn't hear hear this still small voice until we stopped it in the realm of meditation and we looked at consciousness in that way. And, and then we, we, we looked at who we are 
you know, as, as creatures. We looked at who we are as people. What, you know, what is our identity? And we found out something very interesting, and that was you receive 23 chromosomes which, from the sperm of your father and 23 chromosomes from the egg of your mother, and these chromosomes construct you. And then after you're made by them, you are then fashioned by all of these other things which surround you, such as school, church, environment, socialization, friends, and everything, and so that you are totally a creature of the earth. God has nothing whatsoever to do with constructing you. Absolutely nothing. If you didn't have these 23 chromosomes from your father and 23 chromosomes from your mother, you would never exist. No other couple on the face of the earth could contribute the chromosomes in the exact order to make you. In other words, if they were about to have sex and at the last minute they changed their mind, that's the end of you. We even used that silly thing like, remember, maybe one of them was single and uh, they were about to, you know, get on with it and uh, somebody said, well, the, ma the lady said, well, you know, did you, do you have a, you know, a condom? And I said, oh, God, I forgot. You know, and so you're here simply because somebody forgot to go to the drugstore. <laughs> I mean, it's that simple. We make such a thing out of this as God's creation. It has nothing to do with it. So we are creatures of the earth. Totally creatures of the earth as far as our physical makeup is concerned, and then totally creatures of the earth when all the other things start to get on top of that and, and, and make us into how we act and how we think. We had, then we identified God in the Bible. And God in the Bible was identified as light. God is light, and we are the children of light. And then we talked at something else, breaking the bonds of karma, but in a whole new way, not looking at it as individuals, worrying about, you know, what's going to happen to us the next time, or what are we going to do the next time, but as angels of light working to fulfill a mission to break the earthly karma, to break the karma of the earth. If there is a God, is the God worried about whether you're not going to smoke next time? Or is the God worried about what is going to happen to the earth? Because if the earth's karma is changed, that will affect you. You can change your karma, and you can be a most wonderful person, and the most divine person, spiritual, holy, wonderful person, filled with all love and all kindness and compassion. But if you're living in the middle of this insane asylum that they call the planet Earth right now, what good is it? I mean, you know, people say, well, I'm going to come back and change my car. You're not going to do it unless there are people here. Everything is dependent on what somebody else does, how somebody reacts to you. See? So we, we looked at all of these things. And, and, and all of this we, we related to the human psyche, to the body, to the human body, and to that light which enters through the pineal gland into the fetus at the time of conception between the male and female. And then we looked at, at the point of death, when the body can no longer hold this light, where does that light go? What happens? I mean, is there a logical way to explain all of this? Well, we've used the Bible. We've used socialization. We've used uh, documentation of uh, science and quantum physics, uh, psychology, and the whole bit, anatomy, and so forth and so on. And for the most part, I've been able to document that this is all True. I mean, all of this occurs. I mean, there's no doubt that all of this occurs. But, as I was then pursuing this, I thought of a TV program that I used to watch years ago, and I'm sure most of you did too. And this program that I used to watch kind of describes where we have to go in order to really walk face to face with what we're talking about. Because there is a place where physics doesn't go. There's a place where um, science doesn't go. There's a place where religion certainly doesn't go. And all of these things. And I remember the, the name of that, um, would you uh, just throw this away somewhere when you have, to, you know, you don't have to, just, you know, because I just keep pregnant. But the name of that program was One Step Beyond. One Step Beyond. I remember a little guy, Rod Serling, used to come out, and, 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 and the point is, you get, to, you get to some time or other, you've got to start picking up and talking about <coughs> things that happen using logic and common sense, but maybe you can't necessarily pick up a, a book of physics or a book of science and prove that particular aspect of it or even look at it that way. I've always tried to 
have documentation for you, but there are places in discussing these things where no documentation is possible. Science proves everything that is human, everything that is connected to the human body. You should be able to prove about the brain, about the mind. You should be able to prove the existence of light inside of us as, as the operator of the machinery that we call the body. You should be able to prove by the electromagnetism when this leaves and, and, and reasonably where it goes. But all of these things are part connected to the body. Even the planets and, that interact, I mean, the planets that interact with us at this time when we've discovered the eight planets and the nebulae and so forth and so all these things are basically scientific. And though we connect them with the Bible and connect them with all of these things, when you start talking about moving outside of the realm of the body at a point of death, and you, you really have to talk about that, then you have to move in this kind of uh, definition of one step beyond, you know. <laughs> Suddenly, you, you find yourself in something called the kingdom of light, which the Bible refers to. But where do you pick up a book and, and talk about that? So where do you find that? And so then you can say, well, you know, where the heck does he get off out of uh, saying anything about that? Well, the, the good part of it is you don't have to believe it. You don't have to, it doesn't have to become a doctrine of yours, and you don't have to uh, in any way, shape, or form say, well, I'm going to follow this because that's silly. But still and all, I'll, I'll give it to you, and then you go wherever you wish with it. You run however you want to with it. So. <coughs> Let's take a look at what you know about a dead body, which I hope is not too much, but anyhow, um, when a body dies, what do they do with it? They embalm it. They dress it up, put rouge on it and makeup and uh, stick newspaper in its mouth and put it in a box and everybody comes and looks at it and says, gee, that, he really looks great. You got the observer in your mouth and it telling you it looks great. <laughs> All right. The next thing they do is they close the lid, put the box in the ground, and that's the end of that. And then everybody goes back to your house to eat ziti. How do you like that? <laughs> I could never figure that out, but that's generally what they do. They <laughs> You're in a box with paper in your mouth, six feet under the ground. They're going back to your house to eat ziti. Okay. Anyhow, now this body is very much dead. This body is more alive than it ever was. See? That's the interesting part about that. That body is no ways dead. You have moved out. The demolition crew has moved in. And there's a lot of stuff going on. It becomes an exciting thing. Because now that you're done with the body, nature moves in and begins the recycling process. Take down this, take down that, let's use this, we don't need this anymore, we do that. In other words, nature is proving to you that there is no such thing as death because right before anybody's eyes, you don't want to be around when this is happening, I understand that. But right when this is happening, nature is there to recycle, restructure, and make sure that this thing never dies but is put back into use. There are things that move in. It's just like when a body, of, sometimes if people move out of, a, out of a building and demolition crews move in, well right in this body there is something called microbe. And microbe starts to take over. And microbe, I mean, it's a very intelligent process. They take the proteins of the body that you need and convert them to amino acid. That is what these microbes need. They take complex carbohydrates and convert them to simple sugars. And everything, you sure you call it the putrefaction process, the decay process, which is not very nice. They call it just, you know, demolition and uh, regeneration and use for another purpose. Nature has another purpose for you when you get done using you. Not you, that, and that word you shouldn't even come into it. The body that you're using, when you're done with it, nature's got another purpose for it, which proves. I mean, here you have a situation where nature, God, if you, has it all planned exactly that this body, when you're done using it, and it no longer communicates in a bodily function, will start communicating in another function. In another way, nature is, is right. You might not look at it that way. 
I mean, these microbes that do this work, when you go out shopping to the shop right or wherever and bring meat home, you put them in a freezer so you kill the microbes. But if you don't, <laughs> these guys are there, they're going to go to work on that too. Okay. And so what we then understand here is that this body, the body that goes into the ground is the gross part of you. And I don't mean like, I'll gross me out. I don't mean anything like that. I mean, it's, it's, the, it's the, you know, the material part of you is the body. Now, if nature has seen that the material part of you is taken care of and goes on, wouldn't you think that nature at the same point would also make sure that that sophisticated part of you, the part that runs this, the part that drives this, the part that operates this, the thoughts, the love, the, the hopes, uh, the spirit, if you would, for that word, wouldn't that go on as well? So we have proved without any shadow of a doubt that there is a plan in effect that exactly what happens after you no longer can use this, nature takes it and reuses it. And it's certainly not a dead issue under the ground when this is going on. It's very, very active and, and something happens with it, see? So you're going to move out, somebody else moves in, takes over and uses the apartment for something else. And basically, that's what it is. So. Now, here, with this absolute proof that this occurs, then we should be, in the same way, uh, able to prove to ourselves that this same thing called God or nature, which has arranged for this part of you, also has arranged for this part of you. Okay. And obviously, that's, that's very, very true. So, the very va fact that you were born proves that you existed before. Because, you know, where could you, where did you come from? There is something inside of your body operating this thing. I mean, cars do not go to New York or to Atlantic City or wherever they go by themselves. People have to take them there. Your body can go nowhere unless you take it where it's supposed to go, say. All of the material of your body depends on somebody to operate it. And your cells interact with one another. But, but you're the one that has to operate that body, see. And that's what's very important for understanding this word that we use. And, and you know, I'm, I'm going to t take a position of changing the philosophy totally. You don't have to come with it. You can totally disagree with me. That's what you're here for. That's fine. Uh, but this word karma is, is a word that, to me, is totally misunderstood. I mean, w w w what we're, we're thinking here is that when we come back, we have got to work out something that we failed in in a previous life. Okay, here you are, you're back. What are you working at? You haven't a clue. Wouldn't somebody tell you? I think I'm working at it. Maybe I'm working at it. Maybe. You don't know. And so, yeah, but this is, the, this, is, this is this big thing. Let me tell you something. When a tr leaf falls off of a tree, the leaf never goes back to the tree. When the butterfly comes out of the cocoon, it never goes back. It doesn't have to work out all the crap it did when it was a caterpillar. It's new. It's going forward. All of life takes you and carries you forward. There's no looking back. The Bible has a very specific scripture that we'll look at. It says when you put your hand to the plow, don't look back. It's to learn to build on. Your job inside of this body is to break down all of those things that have been infecting the minds of human beings forever that were placed there by generations that went before us. That's the negative karma that God wants broken. And once that negative karma is broken, you'll be free to enjoy all of this with the rest of us. But not whether, oh, you know, like I like to say, you know, you had a problem of smoking in your previous life, so you come back as an ashtray. <laughs> you 
Your job is to follow in the reach. And then to take the burden off of yourself. This is a great burden. Because what did you do? Nothing. All you did was act out all the insanity that has been deposited in here by Aunt Nellie and Uncle Lou and Grandpa and Grandma going back. They all dumped chromosomes and they all filtered down and fell in a puddle in your head. And then you walk around and say, I don't know why I get these ideas from all of these nuts that are part of your family that were out doing all of this stuff for 300 years and they dumped them in you. Why do, why do you do this? These are why people do things like that. What can you do? Is there a God who can say, you're going to come up to the last judgment. I'm going to judge you. You can't judge me. You've got to judge all these nuts that came before me and plowed all of the things into me. Well, let me tell you, quite frankly, with all due respect to my family, if I had had a choice before I was born, I would have never elected to come to that house. Do you think I came there voluntarily? I want to go there. <laughs> Are you kidding? No. <laughs> I don't think I wanted to go there. And so then you're going to blame me? I mean, every day I'm hiding in the woods with my mother behind trees and under leaves for this man's coming after us. And if I start whacking out, you're going to blame me for that? I didn't choose this. I didn't ask for that. And I didn't ask for it to affect my mind the way it obviously has. And you didn't ask for the things that went on to affect you the way they obviously have. If you could come out and say, this is where I want to be, this is where I want to be born, this is how I want to, and that's fine. And then you're responsible for it. That's not the way it was. And so we get into the point of what do we have to change? We have to change all of this traditional mindset. All of this would, and see, that type of philosophy of karma is exactly the same as what religion and fundamentalism. Religion and fundamentalism exists for one thing, I am going to get saved. The whole earth is going down like a kamikaze with flames coming out of its tail. And this person is worrying about, I am going to get saved. That's not what the purpose of this all is. The purpose of this is to regenerate, to change the earth. For you to come into a fetus at light and then work in the middle of all this case. When you come into the fetus at light, and, 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 and come in as light into that fetus, God knows that you have a choice. You have a chance. You're going to act nuts. Not because of you, but because of this light that is inside of you, there is a chance that you will hear, that you will see, and you will start to break down all of these traditional thoughts. That's why you're sitting here staring at me in the first place. Because somewhere along the line, you've got this message, and you have decided to take hammer and chisel and all of these things and start chipping away and breaking down all of these thoughts and waking and watching for this light to come down from the universe between now and the year 2000 to assist you in the destruction of this karma which is doing this to the earth. And once that is changed, you don't have to worry about your negative karma because once the earth is changed and the mind thought of the earth is changed by universal adaptation of light, then you're not going to be thinking, you're not going to be doing, you're not going to be feeling the way that you are now the next time you come back. See? Regeneration is the word. And the word regeneration means to revitalize, to renew life, to make, it, to make it different, to make it new. And I, and I want you, if you would, I, I, I didn't get the, put the thing, but if you look at Matthew chapter 19, if somebody could just tell me what page that's on, Matthew chapter 19. Uh, what page is Matthew chapter 19 on? 95? 795. In Matthew chapter 19, verse, uh, page 795, in verse 28, Jesus says, Verily I say to you, verse 28, You which have followed me in the regeneration, when the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of his glory, you shall sit upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. Which who could care less about sitting on a throne than judging anybody in Israel? I wouldn't even want to go there, let alone judge a place. But, you know, who cares about that? When the Son of Man shall sit in the throne means when you recognize that that Christ element, that God element, is active in consciousness. Through your meditation, the Son of Man now sits in the throne. It is no longer the carnal mind which sits on the throne. It is the Son of Man. It is Uranus which is the Son of Man. It is that which is the kingdom of heaven. You recognize this new light pattern, this new light force that is upon you. This is sitting on the throne. And when that is sitting on the throne, then you will 
will sit on 12 thrones. What the heck are the 12 thrones? The 12 thrones are very easy. I know you didn't bring this because we haven't been... I know you didn't bring this because we haven't been using this very much. But if you look on page 7 of the stuff... <coughs> We go back and use it. On page 7, it identifies the 12 thrones that's being referred to. You will sit upon 12 thrones and judge the 12 tribes of the aspects of your personality. And the 12 thrones on page 7 of the material that we gave you are the 12 cranial nerves of the brain. Olfactory, optic, motor, ocular, trochlear, trifacial, abducan, facial, auditory, glossopharyngeal, pneumogastratic, Spinal accessory hypoglossal. And there are the twelve, there are the twelve tribes. There's the twelve thrones. And that means that you'll have a renewed mind once you recognize that this Son of Man, this Christ, uh, this Christ consciousness, this Uranus is sitting upon the throne of your life. You have elevated yourself in meditation above all of the insanity that dwells out on the streets and the highways and the byways of the earth. See. So you've overcome. You haven't overcome yourself or your individual karma. I mean, you know, here you got people that have karma, and they work on the 35th floor and Wall Street as stockbrokers. And they got to come back next time and work out their karma because they're screwing everybody's stocks up and they've been acting rotten with people. And so what happens? They come back as a Zulu warrior in Kenya. What is he going to do with this? Now he's jumping around like this with here. He, what happened to the 35th floor of Rockefeller Plaza? It's the same guy. Or maybe, maybe, maybe you got karma because of, of the way uh, you've treated your family or something like that. And, and now you're, and you, you know, interacting here in Fork and River. You live in Fork and River and your grandma lives in, uh, in New York. But, and next time you're, you're an Eskimo and you're hacking ice to find seals under the, what is this? I mean, it, 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 it has no relevance to all of this stuff. Bill, if, if the excuse me, excuse me. individual does not begin with himself. Mm -hmm. Okay, that, that goes along with the, the 100 uh, monkey theory. Yeah, can you see him? Oh, they can't see you, Doc. <laughs> <laughs> this is talking about 100 monkeys, and here he is. Right. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> hey, go ahead. Uh, the, uh, the, the fact that, uh, let's go back to the individual who is a serial killer. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's, uh, we discussed that he attracts the same when he returns. Just turn around. Correct? Yeah, that's All fine. right. Now, isn't that karma? No. Then why would he attract the same type of uh, individual personality or carry that through, through with him if it's well, not karma? Well, I would think, you know, and it's worth a discussion, but I would think that what happens here has nothing to do with karma that any individual can break, but is simply a collection of all of the problems that have accumulated within that person in the past from other people. Uh, uh, if you want to call that karma in a way you can, the serial killer may uh, be the product of uh, a defective brain cell for some reason or another. Uh, but that, then that necessarily means that he may not attract that same individual type personality. It's, 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 it's certainly up in the air, and it's certainly possible. The point is, if we're going to think that as light and we leave the body as light, and then uh, we take with us what we've accomplished as breaking down the negative karmas of the earth to revitalize the earth and so forth and so on, uh, if we come back, then we would think that, okay, the only way we're going to be able to continue this is if we bring back with us this positive energy. Now, if we leave with this particular type of thing, uh, that's this uh, diabolical type of Hitler or uh, some of the, uh, what's this? people that did all these different Muslim things, Indian. yeah, any of these people, <laughs> then we could come back with that type of a thing. And of course, it, it could, you know, it could very well be reasonable to consider that it would come back and, and, and con continue this. Well, isn't that karma? Wouldn't you classify that as karma? Yeah, but it's part, but take, but take, you, if you're taking one person, okay, let's take, um, who was the guy that ate everybody, put people in there? Jeffrey, Jeffrey Dahmer. That's pretty, that's pretty nasty stuff. Okay, but now let's take him and say, He's got to work his out. I mean, uh, but but, 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 but God, God's looking at this and saying, no, wait a minute. I'm, uh, you know, he killed four people or five people or seven people or eight people. But what about the, the guy that dropped the atomic bomb on Nagasaki and killed three million like that? Or, 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 or what about the people that went into Vietnam and, and napalmed the place? Or, 
or what about the people that bombed Pearl Harbor? And all these people, it's a, it's, a, it's a whole thing. It's a universal thing. You can take the individual karma as a microcosm and say, man, I've got a problem. But, you know, you've got to look at this from, from, from the exterior, from the universe, and saying, <laughs> she may have a problem. The whole bunch of you have yeah, got a problem. Yeah, but if you don't, the individual doesn't change, the world isn't going to change. Well, the, the, if that's the, what, that's what I but the individual, okay, now that's fine, and I agree with that. But how is the individual going to be changed? If the individual is changed from within by light or from without by light. In other words, if you've got, I don't know how many people populate the earth, but if everybody's got some type of negative karma for one thing or another, it becomes awesome to think of the amount of time. Because if you take the last 2,000 years of trying to correct the karma, it's gone backwards. I mean, it's gotten probably, I think everybody would agree, a lot worse. We've made no progress at all. But what happens then between now and 2000? I think we're just more aware of it now yeah. because of the, the communication. Well, you're more setup. aware of it now because maybe not so much listening to the church as used to be. But let's say, for instance, now between now and 2000, something is going to come down from the nebulae, and this light is going to impact the earth. And all of a sudden, instead of uh, this guy working on correcting his smoking or not killing people anymore, all of a sudden, millions of people all over the earth are going to have the way they think changed, like that, like throwing a switch. And then all of a sudden, we're going to start to understand that I am not to be self-centered and worried so much about myself because when I change the traditional concepts of what I've always thought karma to be, when I change those traditional concepts, suddenly I become part of the light. Those negative things that I've previously been worrying about will change automatically. Mm. I mean... And whatever you said is fine too, and, and it's certainly worth continuing to discuss those things, and we, you know, because they're interesting. But the point is, you know, you and I are looking at this, and we have a perfect right to, as people who are concerned with what we're going to do next time around. We're not even know where we're going to be next time around, but there is something, some entity that does know, and is concerned not so much about whether you straighten yourself out as much as there is a problem inherent, which goes back in the Bible and calls the fall, that has to be cleansed. And when that's changed, all of this will change automatically with it. Yes? I, I think you answered part of my question. Then are we mixing up then karma and an inherent aberration in a person's brain? You know, are we, are we, are we you, mixing you, you, up the you, two? You, you can be, I don't think we're mixing it up. I mean, just in, in talking about it and trying to analyze it. No, 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 has ideas. it been mixed to me, up? Yeah, well, maybe it has. To me, the problem is that people in, in the New Age circles are concerned about how they're going to work out their individual karma. People in church are worried about whether they're going to get saved. God somewhere is not worried about whether that individual is going to get saved or that individual works out his individual karma, but how are we going to break down the whole thing which caused this negative karma in the first place? Okay. You see? I mean, you know, there's, like what Don was talking about, there's a reason that you have this negative karma. There's a reason. But, you know, here you're going you're gonna to have, I don't know, I'm not speaking for anybody here, but the chances are your people are going to have sex with somebody else, and you're going to dump 46 chromosomes into some other kid, and you're going to fill that kid up with the same garbage that you've been filled up with, and here we go again. Well, I, I didn't hear that, but I'm sure it was positive. <laughs> I mean, there's no end to it. There is no end to it. There's no way out of this. But if we can somehow... <laughs> place ourselves not as individuals dealing with karma, but as angels of light who have a job to do. And as you start to plug into this light, all of a sudden, you know, you start to think differently. And now the whole big picture, I'm not going to carry guilt around with me. You don't have to carry guilt around with you. You don't have to carry this negativity of how am I going to work out? How am I going to change? Because as you plug into this light, that's going to change for you. This is the good part. The change is an automatic change. So, uh, Want to come up, Mike, so that everybody can see? This is Mike Farrell, ladies and gentlemen. You go get him, Mike. <laughs> Number <laughs> guy. Wouldn't it, I, I mean, I've done a lot of reading about karma and stuff. And isn't it more about creating an energetic balance and a vibrational balance? I, I, I read a book by a Japanese fellow called Karma and Reincarnation. And this guy has done thousands and thousands of studies. And what he has found, and I don't know exactly what his process is, that in situations where you have an abusive relationship, let's say you're beating up your wife, what he has found through um, whatever process he uses is that in a previous lifetime, the reason you're beating your wife in this lifetime is she killed you in your last lifetime. And you're looking on some level to get even with her. And so, 
So it becomes an energetic and vibrational balancing thing. And I know even in numerology, based on the numbers that are missing in someone's name, that there's a lesson to be learned there, usually indicative of something that would perhaps wasn't done correctly the last time. So I don't know whether it's so much you're coming back to correct it, because consciously you don't know it, but somewhere within the energy that is the ATP and for lack of a better word, spirit within us, there has to be some sort of a knowledge. Because even if you look at nature, what are we striving for? We're striving for balance of nature. Yeah, well, let me tell you where I'm coming from. I understand exactly what you're saying. I am not able, if I, there are so many books and bookstores that talk right. about karma and you're gonna come back and this is why you did this because somebody killed somebody. I can't even get into that because I haven't a clue whether any of that is remotely true. Right. But I do know one thing is remotely true, something is screwed up. And that has made for a lot, of, a lot of bad things. And I do know without any question that if that's the case, that what I have to do then is shut down everything that is screwed up, meaning the mind, and focus on the light and let this thing take care of itself on a, on a universal basis. And then also look for those lights of nebulae and the changes, mm -hmm. patterns of the, to change the whole thing. I mean, and I don't know if what these people say is true. I don't know if the reason somebody beats up his wife or she beats up him is because somebody killed him in a previous life. I mean, it's interesting and it's fun and all of that stuff, but it takes me back into religion where people kind of make up stories. I just don't know if that's true or not. Right. But I do know that there is a lot of problems, and I also do know that the problems, much of the problems that I've experienced in my life came from the depository of people who came on before me and put them in my genetic system. And uh, that means there's a long, maybe thousands of years of junk and suddenly there's a God somewhere who would like to straighten this whole thing out. And I think that we can then say, by focusing on the light, so how would I, how would I break my individual karma? Then I would say, I would break my individual karma by abandoning religion and the fear and the guilt and the insanity and the self-centeredness that goes with it and start focusing on a cosmic universal uh, oneness and regeneration. I would break my karma by separating from the politics of the world and, and the nationalities and the separation from people. So all of these things, separation from people, degrading of women, bu brutalization of nature and the animals is the negative karma that I believe we exist under. But I mean, I, I can't say that this guy that wrote this book is right or wrong. But if, if you're a result of all those chromosomes being dumped in for yeah. generations, then... <coughs> and you would be an end result of that, then isn't it conceivable that you you know, what explains then you not carrying on the behavior of your family? I think that what explains me not carrying on the behavior of the family was being open. I, somewhere along the line, somebody, maybe somebody like you or somebody like Don or somebody came and put a, something into my head and I opened to it. And uh, in my particular case, it was being in fundamentalism and working through all of this thing uh, and then coming across this book by Joel Goldsmith and taking this and, and letting it light up something inside of me. I listened to it. I mean, you could talk to me all night long if I refuse to listen to you. I mean, each person has a need to be open eventually to common sense and logic. And I think that's really what did it. I didn't have any, because I can tell you God's honest truth, Mike, and I haven't a clue as to what karma I'm supposed to work out. And I really, uh, I, that's not my focus because I don't want to focus on myself and as much as, as I've seen the work you do, is focusing on where people are coming from and, and helping in whatever small ways we can. But I think the big picture is the God picture, which is that there is a big, bad, negative karma which has to be broken, which I believe are traditional philosophers. But thank you very much. <coughs> okay, all right, so with a little, uh, we've had a little upheaval here, a little uh, revolution. Like New York. Huh? Like New York. It is like New York. It's, this is exactly the way it gets in New York. Only in New York it's a little different. I mean, they stand up there and they, you know, they, they, uh, Bill, but, but you, what you're trying to say here is stand that up your quickly. path, I can't, my back is killing me. Uh, can you see him? <coughs> all right. What, what you're saying, what you're saying is that whatever you went through as a child, you can relate that it did not place you here? Did that put you on a path some way, somehow, to, to get here, to open you up, to do what you had I to do? I haven't a clue. Yes, it did, Billy. Well, all right. I mean, I, I, yes, it did, Billy. Yes, it did. I, I don't know. But I mean, my, the point is the, 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 the situation that you were living in. What are you saying? You're sitting here rambling. I'm saying, 
<laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I agree that I think your childhood or, or whatever, or a past, or, or when you come, there's something that helps you to make that break to the karma, and sometimes it's what you've experienced in this lifetime. There's no doubt that about gets that. You there. I don't so think there's an individual. Basis. I don't think everything is individual. This whole thing is individual. You know, karma is not death. This, this whole thing, this whole thing is, is individual. It, there's no way that you can ab abandon the individual necessity of taking the responsibility of doing something. <laughs> but what I'm saying is, if we dwell simply, what I am trying to simply get an idea across is, instead, just sit down there. If I am trying to get an, an idea of dwelling, of dwelling incessantly on myself, instead of dwell, I would rather dwell on all of us together breaking the crap that has encompassed all of us than each individual one of us going off and trying to settle our little karmic problems. Okay. I, yeah. okay, now, when you were a child and, and your home was in such an upheaval yes. and you went to church yes. and you said if a heavenly father yes. would kill his son like that, I don't want to have anything to do with it. That's what started you on your path of, of going against everything that was traditional in religion. That's right. And then when your father died and the church wouldn't bury him That's right. because he committed suicide. That's right. And, and, but everybody else in your family, Billy, they were the penguins. They just continued on that little journey. I hope they don't get the TV paper. <laughs> they won't anymore. <laughs> always different. That's, that's right. And, and you know what? His aunt told me that when he was a child, okay, right. that he was so different that he never talked. He never opened up his mouth. Never when everybody thought he was demented because he wouldn't talk to anybody. And, she, and, and after we got married, he just <laughs> motor mouth came. She said, I can't believe it. What happened to you? What happened to you, Billy? You know? But but his whole family, you know, they all went this one path, but you went another path. That's right. Now, you know, Mark has a question. Yes. Come on, Mark. Well, ba basically, I think the essential point is, is correct, because what is wrong, what you're saying is wrong, if I'm not mistaken, is that our story is wrong. Yes. Is that the, the story that we have, our cosmology, that we all have lived by, is wrong. Yeah. And I'll that, that with us or without us, this planet is coded for life. This right. universe is coded for life. I think that human beings are still on probation here. Yes. And that we may work out, we may not, but this planet or this universe is coded for life and it will survive with or without us. So basically we have to get out of these ego-centered right. traditions and religions and am I going to get saved and this right. and that. We have to understand that with the advent of human beings on Earth particularly is that uh, we are able, we are the consciousness of the planet. Right. That for the first time, Earth is able to think about itself. Right. That's what we, you know, when we went out into space, you look back, now that was the quintessential, uh -huh. that we are the brain of the Earth. Okay. Like it or lo not like it, and maybe we're not doing a great job, mm -hmm. that's the way it is right now, okay. as far as we know. Okay. I mean, I think that there's other sentient beings here on Earth that also There's think. no doubt about that. But that, I, I, you know, what you're saying, and I, I agree with that, is that you have to get out of this whole thing of what's going to happen to me, where did I come from, how did I right. build, is that we have the wrong story, let's start with a different story. That's right. But you, you see the problem, you know what you get into a problem with, and this is the problem. Let me, let me tell you where I get into a problem. Uh, in religion, you have a very difficult time in changing what is God, what is, what is spirit, and so forth, because in New Age, you have a very, when you touch this, people get upset. They did and, 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 yeah, they do. The people get upset because this is the way they're taught now in New Age, and you can't touch this. So in other words, you can't step outside here, and that's all I want to do right now is just step outside and talk in another realm. I mean, I can tell you exactly what, what you guys are talking about is what happened. According to the scriptures that go back, you know, when knows when, it says the sons of God intercoursed with the daughters of men, and that was the problem. In other words, that which was the light inside of here became obsessed with that which is the flesh or that which is the emotions, and all of these things built up into gradually where the, the flesh or the carnal mind overwhelmed that which was the light inside. That's the karma that has to be broken. Because, you know, we can read books and so forth, but we'll never ever... I know one thing. I don't know how, really, 
to break this thing. I don't know what caused me or what caused you or what caused you or in any of these ways to go off in different directions. I don't know that. But I do know one thing. I do know that by focusing on this light in meditation, you'll break the karma. I know that. And when you break one piece of that karma, you're going to break all of it. I am not worried about you coming back in the next life having to break some of the problems you've had in this life because you've already attached to that light. And that light will break it for you. And I think that's the beautiful part. That's the part where they talk about Jesus paid for your sins. Because the death of the self and the resurrection to sit at the right hand pays or it, it, it washes away, it eliminates all of that because now you're an angle of light. You return to light. And you don't have to worry about this. See? But I mean, it's, it's, and I'm very happy. This is very, very interesting. That's the liveliest that you people have looked at. I've been, you've been staring at me for six years. It's the first time you came to life. So maybe we've struck a nerve. What? You, well, you know, you were getting this is out of here. <laughs> you struck this nerve when we were in New York yes. a, a week ago. Oh, okay. yeah. And when he bad. said the word karma, it was oh, a cool. Yeah. But after what you said, you know, I didn't use the word universal. Yeah, well, that's okay. true. And, and, and so if we want to talk about the universal karma. But the point is, let me go back and say this one thing. You shouldn't get so hung up to any cult, any group. The Rami Swami Yamagani may be screwed up. <laughs> I mean, I may be screwed up, but you know that. <laughs> but Rami Yami Swami Screw Me Yami might be screwed up too, but you don't know that. So, okay. All right. Right. Okay. So, when we talk about this whole being regenerated, see, this is something a lot of you don't understand. It says in Genesis 128, and God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful, multiply, and look at this word now, replenish the earth. Okay? That's what it says. Genesis 128. It says, replenish the earth. What does that mean? Put it back. Put it back the way it was supposed to be. That's what you're here for. It's screwed up. The whole thing is screwed up. See, you're worried about you and what's going to happen to you. God is worried about the big picture. The whole thing is screwed up. He said, it doesn't say, okay, here you are for the first time, now go out and build this. It doesn't say that. It says replenish it. In other words, it was all here, it was destroyed, it was screwed up. Here, it's up to you. Replenish it. Make it right again. Do it right again, say. So, anyhow, uh, because of the, give me an extra ten minutes because of the interference that I have. <laughs> I, I love the interference. Don't, don't misread me. I, I mean, it, it wasn't interference at all. It's, it's the most exciting thing that can happen because, you know, uh, I don't know why, but anyhow. <laughs> okay. But, but think for a minute when we're talking about that. The leaf doesn't go back to the tree. The butterfly doesn't go back to the cocoon. You're not going to go back to that stuff because you've gone forward. When you're here and you're worrying about your negative karma, you're here. <laughs> then you move upward in this kundalini to the pineal to light. Now you're up here. Now you're up here. You're not going to go back there. And this is the point I'm trying to make to you. You're not going to be. You're the butterfly now. You're not going to go back to the cocoon. You don't have to worry about what you were doing when you were a caterpillar. When you were a caterpillar, you had all kinds of negative karma. But you're not a caterpillar anymore. You're a butterfly. And I mean that with all sincerity, because you've come out of the cocoon, you've broken out of the cocoon, and you've flown up into the air through meditation. See. And, 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 and just try to think about it. Don't worry about going back and straightening out all the screwed up things you did in, in the cocoon. Look at, look at page 844. Page 844. And, 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 and I appreciate everything that everybody said. And there's nothing I can, I can't say that one person that spoke on talk this morning was wrong in any way, shape, or form. They weren't. But that's the way you start to learn when each person starts to open up and discuss these things. <coughs> Look at Luke chapter 9 and verse 62. Page no, uh, 844. And Jesus said in Luke chapter 9, verse 62, No man, having put his hand to the plow and looking back, is fit for the kingdom. You can't do it anymore. Those are, those, you know, I can't think of what I did. I have to think of what I'm doing and where I'm going. I'm going forward. I'm going up in this angle of light. And that'll change this whole thing, see? And 
now just stay with me for about three more minutes, promise. Every person who dies will exit the body, go to the water, receive molecular energy, enter the air, and meet photon and return to the fetus. Just like that. Out, revive, back. And hopefully when they come back, they'll find someone who will be able to do what somebody did for you. But remember, what's happening there is the caterpillar is going and coming back. Everyone will follow that path after they die, but not you. You have opened yourself to the light, and when you exit the pineal, you'll not go to the water. You'll veer to the right, and you will meet Samael. They won't meet Samael. It's not their time to meet. Samael, because you have something, and Samael will ask you. And Samael will ask you. See, that stuff is over with. Samael is going to ask you. You are going to be admitted to the lodge, but you've got to first validate yourself. You've got to first validate Samael. What is the sign? And we'll talk a little bit more about it in the future. And you've got to validate the Samael. What is the word? And that word is zozio now becomes more clear to you because it's the light filtered by crystal, which is that light which is angles into the fetus, which is the light that you are. And then you'll, you, you'll tell him the number. If you have received these instructions, and let me end with this, okay? This is it. Those who have not the understanding will return. Those of you will go to a staging area at this lodge through Samael, and Samael steps to the left. And then when you return here, you will understand and remember everything that you did previously. <laughs> you will understand everything. Now let me, let me tell you, because this is serious, and then we're done, OK? It's not a game anymore. It's, God has not put people here to try to figure out if there's some karma they have to break. Everything is very serious. Everything is very adult. You will know. You know. You are an angle of light now who has come into the light, and now you begin to understand. When you are dispatched back into the kingdom of light, and remember, before that even happens, you're going to have this incursion by the nebula and all of this kind of stuff. But let me tell you, when you are back on this earth again, you who have been in the meditation, you who have followed in the regeneration, and I will give you the scripture, and you will be this, okay? Okay. This is the last one, page 985. Page 985, and in page 985, you look at the book of Hebrew. And in the book of Hebrew, in chapter 13, all right? Read with me, and I think you'll understand what I'm talking about. Read with me verse 2. Be not forgetful to entertain strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unaware. Do you understand? Those who have gone, who have met Samael, who have gone to the lodge, those who have been regenerated, those who have returned and are totally knowledgeable about what their job is and what they have to do. And as it says here, these are angles of light who have returned, and people who have entertained them have entertained angels unaware. OK? So we will go, as I said, like, you know, what you guys are talking about you know, is, is really very valuable and very interesting. But also now we've got to also take a step here and, and go where nobody has ever gone in talking about these things. And I'll tell you something. I mean, Take a little bit of, of, of take a little bit of, of thought and a little bit of, of feeling. I mean, here Alviro talked to you this morning about a couple of men who.
who received the Nobel Prize for Science. And what were they talking about? ATP and cyclic AMP and how important it is to you. Where did you hear that? Those this ATP and cyclic AMP were not strange words for you. In fact, they're right in the things that you're carrying with you. And you, who didn't, you didn't hear it on television. You heard it right here. So, where did this come from? How did I know? I don't know. Any, I didn't get any notebook. <laughs> Obviously not. I don't know that stuff. See? So, uh, and remember, nobody who said anything here this morning said one thing that was wrong. <coughs> Everything is over. The beautiful part of it is to start discussing it, to start thinking about it. The bad part of it is when you get into, whether it be New Age or religion, where you're afraid to question anything. Say, well, you know, this is the way it is because this is the way my group thinks. Forget that. And that's fine, to express yourself and to feel the way you feel and to share your ideas and get new input from other people and then maybe kind of stretch out your thought. Maybe don't put your thought in concrete like they have in religion and say, well, you know, let me think about this and let me open yeah, myself up. Yeah, I know. This is ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now you taught us a symbol yes. and Azozio yes. and 4555. Now you're saying that when we die, that, that we go through that same thing, that the Azozio and Samahel? You will not then get to the do, lodge. Then do we go to 4555? You, one thing at a time. <laughs> I'm afraid everybody's going to be committing suicide around here, you know? <laughs> now, you will not get to the lodge. You don't get to the lodge until you're able to discuss these things with Samael. Samael is the opposer. Samael has no concern about the people in Fork and River walking down the street. Couldn't care less because they don't know a thing. So he's not concerned about it. What he is concerned about, those who have opened to the light have to validate the light as to what the light is about. And we'll spend a little more time in that so as we go on. Lodge 4555? We'll, we'll, we'll discuss that. That's all for today, <laughs> folks, because they're coming out of their seats and they're totally rowdy and carrying on and acting totally out of sorts. Yeah, lodge? <laughs> it's an interesting, you know, that's a very interesting point because it's called the Great White Lodge of the ancient Egyptians. Okay. Okay, that's it. We'll see you. Bye-bye.